Oh. Yes, it is. <laughs> Time to start. Okay. Um, so, uh, and we're just still letting people in to um, the event. Uh, there's a lot of you. There's a lot of you waiting in the um, the waiting room. So uh, we'll be we'll be letting you in as soon as possible. Um, everybody, welcome to uh, the One Million Women Love Earth event. I'm Natalie Isaacs. I am the founder of One Million Women. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and to Christiana Figueres for being our special guest for this event. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which I am speaking to you all from today. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, Gadigal of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects um, to the elders past, present and future. I am talking to you today from the northern beaches of Sydney. It is early morning um, and it's a little overcast here in Sydney. Um, um, but wherever you are in the world, whether you're having your brekkie, whether you're in your jammies, whether it's late afternoon, uh, I wish, I hope that you are well and that you are safe. This is the second of our Love Earth um, online series that we are bringing to you over the coming weeks and months. And it is such an absolute honour to have Christiana Figueres with us all. Uh, there are 600 of us on this call today um, and there are more just flowing in so I don't know where that will get to but it is just beautiful and I thought before we got started it would be really lovely for us all to say hello to each other and to see each other from around the world so could I get you all to go on gallery view you, some of you may be on speaker view at the moment but if you could all go on gallery view and when you're on gallery view, you can scroll across to see everybody um, and you can, we can all wave to each other a hello. Um, hello, everybody. And what would be so beautiful if you could just go down to the chat and click on the chat and, um, and say hello and where you're from in the world, because it would be so beautiful for Christiana to see where we are all from. So just go down to the chat say hello and um and where you are in the world we've got oh my gosh i can't go through it so quickly we've got uh, look at that christiana look at that in the chat can you see where everybody is from they're just from, amazing they're from all over the world um it's just beautiful i was going to read people and where they're from but i just cannot do it it is just going <laughs> way too quickly the only person i can see though not the only person i can see but down on the second line on my screen is my mummy and i can see her and she's in brisbane Queen. hello mummy hello mummy <laughs> um, <Hello, mommy. laughs> christiana can see you too so I'm going to be chatting to Christiana um, um, and we're just going to, she is going to share her wisdom with us all over the next half hour. And then we're going to get as many questions as we can fit into this hour event. So please, whatever your questions are, throw them in the chat or wait till we're um, about to ask questions. I have got this beautiful One Million Women team. Team, say hello to everybody. One Million Team, you'll see. See us all in our One Million Women T-shirts, T-shirts who will be grabbing as many questions as they can to ask Christiana. So I met Christiana in 2013. Uh, One Million Women won a United Nations Momentum for Change Award and, and that's when I met Christiana. And Christiana has been a supporter of One Million Women um, ever since and has been incredible support to, um, to me personally. Um, she makes you feel like you are the only person in the room. And one of my favourite um, stories and visions of Christiana is when she was here in Sydney um, on her trip. Remember, Christiana, you were only here for 24 hours and I grabbed you for a couple of events and we went to a school and Christiana spoke to a thousand schoolgirls and there she was on stage and there was not, um, a, not a murmur, a 
thousand schoolgirls were fixated on Christiana. I don't think anyone even blinked. Christiana cried, the girls cried, and she <laughs> made them feel like they were the most powerful young women on this planet. Um, she got to the hearts of a, of a thousand schoolgirls that day, and um, they will always remember the day that Christiana Figueres came to visit them. Christiana is the former UN Executive Secretary for Climate Change who brought together nations and sub-nation governments, sub-national governments, corporations and activists, financial institutions and communities of faith, think, tank, um, think tanks and technology providers, NGOs and parliamentarians to jointly deliver the unprecedented climate change Paris Agreement. Christiana has been credited for forging a new brand of collaborative diplomacy. Christiana, um, hello and thank you so much for joining us. Before we start, could I get everybody to go back to speak of you? Could you all go back to speak of you so we can get the full um, picture of Christiana as she speaks to us all? Thank you all so much. Let's go back to speak of you now. Christiana, um, it's so beautiful to see you. You are talking to us from your home in Costa Rica. Would you be able to share with us a little more about this historic uh, Paris Agreement? There's so many of, of us on this call today that don't know the full UN process and how you got 195 countries to all agree. Tell us the significance of that and how you're going five years on. Or how it's all going. Well, first of all, uh, Natalie, so good to see you again. Uh, I, you are just such a ray of sunlight every time uh, that we get together, that we speak. And thank you for inviting me to join uh, to join a conversation with One Million Women again. It just struck me as you were giving your introduction, Natalie, that um, this whole isolationist mentality and behavior that we've had to adopt for all very prudent and responsible reasons, one of the positive uh, impacts that it has had without minimizing the lives that we have lost and the millions of livelihoods that have been severely affected, one of the positive um, impacts is the democratization of conversations. Because, you know, it would have been, as I was looking, looking at this long list of people coming from everywhere. I mean, I was trying to think, let's say one country that is not there. It's difficult to find one country that is not there. And had we wanted to do this in person, first of all, it would have been very expensive for the flights. It would have been very expensive for the planet because of all of the emissions. It would have had a toll on our health. And most of us would not have been able to get there. So the democratization of these kinds of meetings, of the messages, of interchanging ideas and experiences is one of the very, very interesting um, uh, um, positive impacts that are coming out of what we think of as isolationist um, behavior. So, you know, just um, I'm, I'm rejoicing in the fact that uh, that this technology that we're all still learning to use uh, is actually allowing for uh, for this kind of communication. So thank you for reaching out to uh, to Zoom. Uh, aren't, aren't we all doing Zoom marathons every day? I, I have a feeling that I get on Zoom at five in the morning and at eight o'clock at night. I'm still Zooming. And how is that possible? But, uh, but it really has brought us all uh, so much closer together. Um, now, quickly going back to Paris, which seems like an eternity ago, Natalie. Um, actually, it was pretty easy to get 195 countries to have full consensus on a legal document. We just put them all in a room, we locked the door, uh, and we said no food, no bathroom breaks, no sleeping until you all agree, and you know, then we have a Paris Agreement. That was pretty easy. <laughs> now, um, the other story of that um, is that we realized pretty early on that our human nature is such, and human nature, I mean us individuals, but also sovereign gover governments, which also have human nature because they're made up of humans. Uh, our human nature is such 
that it would be very difficult for anyone or for any government to do something that they perceive is against their interests. And that was the very, very important turnaround to the logic of the Paris Agreement that is built on the self-interest of countries. This, admittedly, the enlightened self-interest, but still the self-interest on countries that throughout the five years of process and of conversations, and at that time, I did travel to almost every other, every country in the world. I wish we had been on Zoom. But, um, but those conversations were conversations of deep listening, of asking many questions, of trying to get to um, the point of realization of where every country, every economy, every society was going to be and where they see themselves being five or 10 years hence. And therefore, as they move forward with their thinking and the visibility of the path forward, then to find the common ground among all of them. Because there wasn't that much common ground from where they were at that point in time. But once you project yourself into the future, the possibility for reaching common ground really expands. And so that was, I think, the, um, the, the, the change in logic that we instituted in order to get everyone to agree to a long-term path of uh, economic decarbonization for the world. And then, of course, the fact that we brought in Everyone, it wasn't just governments, not, not just national governments, it was subnational governments, it was the corporate uh, world, it was the finance world, it was insurance, it was the spiritual communities, it was uh, women's groups, indigenous groups, youth groups, everyone who is going to be touched by climate change. And that was also very helpful because then governments felt much more accountable to, uh, to the broader set of stakeholders that are going to be influenced and touched and impacted by their decisions so very brief summary yeah it was it was an ext extraordinary thing you did christiana um and you know um this this pandemic has shown pandemic has shown us that um we can literally transform overnight in the face of adversity and equally it is allowing us to see a new path when we emerge from all of this and start to rebuild um and i know this as you say there are so many people suffering but it has given us this opportunity to stay, take stock of our our lives um, to work through what's important to see that the love of earth and community uh, as it is more important than the stuff that we buy um, there is this real opportunity to go to not go back to business as usual the science and by your trajectory we have to transform the world by 2050 um, we have to get our emissions down by half in the next 10 years how do we how do we take that right path right now well um actually the choices that we have to be uh, that we have to make have been placed very starkly in front of us because what this covid uh, pandemic has done it has brought on as we're all aware of the greatest economic recession and depression since World War II. So we have never been in such a financial situation in the past 70 years. What that actually means is that governments are going to have to, and they already are, resorting to uh, unprecedented scale of financial fresh capital injections into the economy. Already reached 15 trillion and going up to 20 trillion. The interesting thing about that with respect to climate change is that because of the scale of the injection of finance into the system, into the entire economic system, those recovery packages are actually going to dwarf anything that we could possibly imagine to do with policy changes, with measures on climate change, with incentives on climate change, all of that, which have been the levers that we have had to reduce emissions, all of that gets substantially dwarfed underneath this huge Goliath of a capital injection. And furthermore, that capital injection is going to occur over the next 18 months, yeah. unprecedented in the history of humanity. 
So what that actually means is that the emission reduction that we know needs to occur over the next decade, which as you, Natalie, have just said correctly, we need to be at one half our emissions by 2030. Whether we do that or not is going to depend 95% on the characteristics of the so-called recovery packages. Because $20 trillion going into the economy will determine the structure and the content and the logic of that economy, whether it is high carbon based, in which case we would inject all of that capital to go back to history into a high carbon economy that we're trying to get out of, or we can use those $20 trillion to actually accelerate the decarbonization of the economy and fast forward ourselves into the low carbon, high resilient economy that we know that we need. So, you know, if we thought we had 10 years to address climate change, forget that, we now have 18 months. What that means for all of us on the call is that we all have the responsibility to use whatever influence we have, personal, institutional, city level, community level, association level, whatever influence we have to ensure that all of those recovery packages are going to be green, pointing us to a decarbonization, and inclusive. If we put those recovery packages in place and they leave the most vulnerable behind, that is, first of all, immoral and inhuman, but also an economic, social, and political time bomb that we will not be able to recuperate from. So very, very focused attention on the characteristics of the so-called recovery packages. I'm hoping that we're not going to recover, that we're actually going to reset, reimagine, redefine, and recreate in order to put the basis in, not just for a recovered economy, but for a regenerated economy. And, and just to that, Christiani, you know, um, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had our One Me Women big get together, a, a Zoom call like this, and um, one of and we one of them the questions, and a lot of you were on that call, um, and and you know a, a lot of the questions were the same, and it was, please tell me what I can do. Uh, what are the three things that I can do? What are what are the things that I can do to make an impact now while I'm at home or as I emerge from here, um, what, what is it that I can do um, to make the biggest impact? And um, oh. what, would, what would you your answer be to that? You know, we have to make these dramatic gains over the next 10 years. What do we all do, the 600 of us on this call? Well, let's first start with what we can do as individuals we can decide that we're not going to forget this moment that we're sharing right now. And that this moment that we're sharing right now is one that we will replicate. What I mean by that is we will resist the temptation to get on a plane and fly three times around the planet to give each other a hug. I love to hug Natalie, but honestly, the emissions that are at the basis of that hug, just don't justify it, right? So now we're being forced to enter and to intercommunicate in this manner. Let us not let go of that very good habit. Let us really, really rethink business travel. Let us rethink commuting to work. Let us, in fact, even rethink leisure travel. I don't think that we should give up leisure travel because being close to nature, especially if it's eco-travel, is very important for our souls. Absolutely. But not if it's going to be a two-day trip around the planet. Can we actually go for longer periods of time and be there, truly be in the presence of nature wherever you choose uh, to commune with nature? But travel, whether it is air travel or land, is totally for us to determine how we're going to do that, how we're going to work, how we're going to communicate with each other, how we're going to work. Now, our individual decisions and choices will definitely have huge impact because it will determine what the airline industry does. 
It will determine what the car manufacturing industry does. It will determine what public transport does. But let us not think that it is up to the airline industry to decide how we will travel or whether we will travel. That is our own personal individual responsibility. Yes. The same thing, and you know, Natalie, you, you, you are so good at this. The same thing is on foods. Do we really need foods that have traveled again three times around the planet? Or can I be happy with the foods that my country produces and you happy with the foods that you produce? We don't have to do that. So what we shop for will send very, very important economic signals to those industries. Not only food origin, but which foods we consume. If we are still consuming meat, that does not send a good signal. In fact, the meat industry and the cattle industry have been one of the very, very first sacrificed industries to COVID because of the working conditions in slaughterhouses. And so interestingly enough, there has been a huge drop in the presence of market in international markets and a huge increase in vegetarian and plant-based protein because the working conditions are completely different. So two very, very clear things that we can do as individuals. And of course, I cannot leave off politics. Yeah. Engage in politics. As soon as we can get out of our homes and in our offices, take to the streets. Demand responsible policy in every country. Every country has to. The, there's one responsibility of every government, one, and that is to protect their citizens. Many countries have lived up to that responsibility with respect to COVID. Every country should live up to that responsibility with respect to climate change. We have to make governments accountable to protect their citizens. Politics and political engagement is key. And that can only be done individual by individual. Every person taking to the streets, every person voting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we are going to be pushing that a lot this year, Christiana. Um, one of the other things that I said of, uh, that you could do while you're at home is to actually be researching where your money goes your bank, um, your super fund, um, and uh, to really make sure that you are not investing your money in banks and institutions that in invest in fossil fuels. When I started One Million Women, I thought that I was this amazing superhuman that had just gone from inaction to action, just changed my life completely. Um, and it was three years in at One Million Women before I realised that I was actually banking with, with a bank that invests in fossil fuels. <laughs> so, you know, um, that is a really powerful thing that we, we, can, we can all do. Yes. No, absolutely. To be very conscious of where that money is. And, you know, you will be, you will be delighted to know that most financial institutions are divesting from fossil fuels very, very quickly. Uh, and in fact, even accelerating that now during this crisis. Uh, but yes, we should not let our money be used to prop up industries um, that are no longer viable. They simply are no longer viable. Yes. Now, I put out individual changes that we can do. Of course, all of that has to be complemented with systemic transformations that can only be done by governments and by corporations. But since we here are in, an, uh, in a collection of individuals, I just highlighted the um, individual opportunities that we have to, um, to affect change. Yeah, yeah. And um, the world is made up regardless of whether you're in a government or whether you're at your, in, at your home, at school, we are made up by a collection of individuals. And Natalie, one question. Do you, as one uh, million women, do you actually encourage all our sisters to do their own carbon footprint? Oh, absolutely. Constantly doing that. Constantly. Okay. And, um, um, you know, that is, you know, one of the big things about One Million Women is that we focus on it all. We focus on how you live and how do we get to living with the least impact on the planet? And then how do we use our voices, our influence and our vote? 
It has to be the whole thing. And it's go, and it starts, you know, just going back to something you just said before, it also starts with this, this love and appreciation of our earth and the relationship that we have with our earth. Um, but Christiana, I want to get to this. And um, where I, I, yeah, the, the book. And for uh, those of you who haven't got a copy of the book, please grab yourself a copy. Um, the girls will put it in the chat for where you can, you can get a copy. Um, and, and I saw Christiana only in early March before the whole lockdown when she was out here getting, uh, receiving the, the Sydney Peace Prize and well-deserved um, too, and, and had just launched her book, that she wrote with Tom Rivett Karnak, and it was, it's the future we choose surviving the climate crisis. Um, Christiana, you, you navigate a lot of stuff in this book. And um, one of the, there's, there's a, an air, there's, a, there's chapters in there about our shifting our mindsets. And we spend a lot of time at One Million Women um, working on how do you shift mindsets and behavior? How do you move people from inaction to action? How do we take them from doing nothing right through, pulling them through to using their voice and exercising their vote. Um, so this question is actually from our board chair, Carolyn Pig Caroline Peacock, who was on the call somewhere, Caroline. She was saying, what is, most, what is one of the most effective things that you have done to bring people along who are not, who are not sure? How do you bring them along this journey? You know, um, I, I decided a long time ago not to lecture people because, especially people who are climate deniers or climate ignorance or climate, uh, you know, um, look the other way, um, because it, it doesn't really connect with them. So my choice of a tone of conversation with people who are not yet engaged is first to have a neutral conversation through with, with deep listening on my part, through which my purpose is to elucidate what is important to that person and to really try to see into the heart and mind of that person. What is that passion? What does that person stand for? What are those person's aspirations and their visions for the future? What does that person want for herself? Himself, himself, their children, their friends. Um, and amazingly, once you get to that, then you're no longer talking to the head, you're actually interchanging and exchanging energy heart to heart. And guaranteed, anything that that person is really passionate about, is really wanting to bring about and manifest in their lives will have a climate change implication because climate change affects every human endeavor, everything that we do. And so by definition, there's nothing that we can do that is not affected by climate change. Yeah. So that if you actually find what is the passion for that person, now you have a much stronger ground to have that conversation and you don't even have to use the word climate change. Exactly. Stay right there where that person is and ask that person, so how do you see it five or 10 or 15 years from now? That important thing that is important to you. Would you like to maintain that? Would you like to bring that about? Would you like to foster it? And then you can begin to bring in the threats that climate change have to that without even mentioning climate change. Yeah. Um, and now you have a person that is actually engaged in self-inquiry, and that's where you really win a friend. When you can get that person to self-reflect and figure out, hmm, I really want to do X, and if X is threatened by Y, maybe I should be paying some attention to Y. So um, it's not about lecturing at people. It's not about, you know, giving a piece of your mind. It's about truly taking off our own shoes and getting into the shoes of the other person. Yeah. And seeing the world from their experience. And, and, um, and as you say, Christiana, it is about this has got to travel from your head to your heart. And, and I know that story 
absolutely personally because I was that person disengaged on this issue for all sorts of reasons. And once I realized in my heart that I was powerful through everything that I, I do in life, everything I do shapes the world. And once I truly understood it in my heart, I got the point on climate change. And as you do, I started a women's movement. <laughs> but listen, hey. how, do we, how, do we, um, how do we not let ourselves slip into despair with this? You know, it is an overwhelming, um, it is overwhelming climate change. And there is a whole lot of different, you know, emotions. We feel grief, despair, denial, anger. Um, and how do we navigate our way through this? You know, how do we... Um, let ourselves sink into the grief when we need to and, and allow that to breathe. But how do we stop ourselves from slipping into despair? You, you say in the book, and I love this quote, that anger that sinks into despair is powerless to make a change. Anger that evolves into conviction is unstoppable. So how do you look after your well-being? And I know I've got to, look, I've got one more question. I've got a few more questions. I'm not going to get to them because I just, I really do want to open it up so everyone can ask their questions. But if you could tell us how you look after your well-being and how we can, how, what we can do to, to do that too, um, that would be great. Well, well, I can share with you what I do uh, and then invite everyone to figure out what is best for you because uh, when, you know, one recipe is not necessarily for everyone. Um, but I, I, for me, it's always been very helpful to understand that we humans have an incredible capacity to deal with several realities at the same time and at the same level. And so, yes, there is a lot of pain and there is a lot of grief in climate change because we are losing out on biodiversity. We are compromising the future of our children on and on and on. I don't have to give you the long list. So it is truly a grief that I carry very deeply. At the same time, at the same time, I don't think that that is overwhelming. Because the moment that we choose to act on that as individuals, as women, then we get out of the I feel sorry for myself and I feel sorry for humanity and we empower ourselves. The moment that we decide, what am I going to do with my savings? What am I going to do about my travel? What am I going to do about my consumption level? Do I really need 20 pairs of shoes? Yeah. What am I going to do, you know, about every single piece of my life. Now I don't have to fall into despair because I know that I am contributing to the solution. You only get despaired if you actually stand back and you witness all of this other reality going on and you feel overwhelmed. But feeling overwhelmed is your choice. You can actually decide to be witness to the grief and the loss and the despair and the frustration and at the same time, to be active on the solution space. And it is that balance that actually allows us to move forward. And to all of those who argue, well, little old me, how am I going to contribute to a global solution? Well, if COVID hasn't also taught us a lesson on that, if little old us hadn't been obedient and sat at home for two months, we wouldn't even be close to getting out of the health crisis. So COVID has taught us that yes, we need systemic changes and if we can't reach those, we feel overwhelmed, but at the same time, we need systemic direction and guidance and regulations, but we also need individual behavioral changes and those we're responsible for and no one else. And it is because half of humanity has been responsible and stayed home for two months that we're actually finding a global exit out of the health crisis. So a very, very concrete example of the power of individuals, not as single standing people, but the power of individuals as a collectivity. Yes, um, agree, completely agree. Christiana, one last 
incredibly important question before um, I hand it over to Grace to um, get grab some questions from everybody on the call. There are over 600 women, and I'm sure there's a few blokes too on this call, but there are over 600 women on this call. You have always put equality for women at the core of solving the climate crisis. This goes to the very heart of who we are. Tell us how you see that interlinked. Well, um, honestly, I always have to smile about this issue, right? Because um, there are sadly people on this planet who don't have two legs, but most people do. And most people use both legs to mobilize ourselves and to go from point A to point B. So if we do that as individuals, here's my question. How come society insists on using only one leg, the male leg, to get from point A to point B. Wouldn't we all be better off if we actually use 100% of the potential that is available to society, to the economy, to all of us, 100% of our potential. I guarantee that we would walk down the path of progress with much sure footing and much quicker. Yeah, that's right. Look. And the list goes on and on about the power of women to change the world. Um, Christiana, I am going I do have several more questions. I am going to not ask them because I want to open this up to everybody else. I'm going to hand it over to Grace. Um, Grace Liley is our incredible head of digital at One Million Women. She just does amazing things for us. And um, she is, has been gathering lots of questions um, from everybody. And I know that probably you all would love to answer, uh, ask your question yourself, but there's just too many of us on the call, I think, to be able to do it that way, Grace. I'm You're not Grace, sure. Grace, you're giving her a very difficult job, Natalie. <laughs> so, Grace, I'm throwing it over to you. If you think this with people with their hands up can ask the question, that's fantastic. Otherwise, just go for it and get in as many questions as you can for Christiana. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so thank you so much for all your questions. We've got a lot have come through. So um, one that sort of a lot of people are asking is basically if you've got um, politicians in your country who are really supporting the fossil fuel industry, sort of what like exact action should you be taking or like what exactly can you do about that? Raise your voices, be out on the streets, write letters, write op-eds, write articles, um, remove your money from fossil fuels and vote, 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 vote. Vote all the way from the national government all the way down to your community. Um, you know, it is really amazing to me, I have to tell you, I work pretty closely with many of the oil and gas uh, sector CEOs. And you know what they tell me about? what is really moving them to have to transition out of those hydrocarbons and into better energy is their perception of the diminishing social tolerance of the sector. Social tolerance is their word for what you are doing. The they are listening to this voice. They are totally listening to this voice and they are reacting to this because their cost of capital is coming up because inst financial institutions don't want to fund them anymore because their resource is too risky and because there's no public opinion behind them. So do not be afraid to raise your voice at every opportunity. Do not be afraid to channel your money um, and do not be afraid to be very, very vocal about this. We are winning that race. We are winning that race. We just have to push one, one little bit farther. Okay, um, thank you. And then another question that's come up a few times is also, um, how do you sort of compare like individual action? It, um, some people are saying like, how do you take action as an individual if you don't have a lot of money? Like um, they're saying, say for example, if um, the green products are more expensive, sort of how do, we, how do we navigate that? Or is there a way to take action like when you're sort of just, fighting to survive right now and don't have a lot of money? It's a very important question. And honestly, the financial hit 
that uh, is coming out of COVID is just indescribable and truly, truly painful. So I'm very aware of the depth of that, uh, of that question. Um, but in an attempt to answer that question, you don't have to buy uh, expensive luxury green items. You can buy the fruits that are produced by your local farmers. Uh, you don't necessarily have to put your money into high fashion companies with, I don't know, that produce um, whatever they produce. Um, you know, one, one, one of the things that I love the most is to inherit clothes for myself and turn the clothes over when I get too fat for them. Um, and, you know, to recycle, I mean, there's nothing nicer than this, this shirt, actually, that I'm wearing. I inherited it. And every time that I put on this shirt, I love the shirt because I love the color and it's really comfortable. But I think of the person who gave me the shirt. And so, you know, that doesn't require any monetary exchange at all. That is a heart to heart exchange. So she gave it to me, uh, you know, with a beautiful message. And I just totally enjoy not only wearing the shirt, but thinking of that person and thinking of the motivation and the message that she gave me with the shirt. So there are so many ways that have nothing to do with money, nothing to do with money. And the circular economy concept is one that we have to get into our heads. The circular economy really gets away from the cash economy, right? It's one that really emphasizes the sharing. Um, and whether it is, you know, sharing clothes, whether it's sharing the, I don't know, the kitchen thing that you only use once or twice or three times a year and your neighbor doesn't have one, well, then share it with them. We have to be able to move to much more of a shared economy where we can share things and, um, and thereby create actually more abundance. Because once we all share the same thing, we are deriving the benefit from that widget, whatever it is, for many people rather than just for one person or one family. So we're actually creating abundance. And that is the mentality that we have to switch to. Not a mentality of scarcity, but how do we create abundance in our lives? And abundance doesn't have anything to do with our bank account. It has to do with the depth and richness of our personal experiences. Definitely. Um, okay, we have so many questions coming through. I'm trying to get to all of them. Um, I'm so sorry for you, Grace. Too. Speaking about abundance, there's an abundance of questions. <laughs> oh, there is. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to sort of like bring them all together, like which ones are repeating a lot. Well, good luck with that. You're doing a brilliant job. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this one's from Lindsay. Um, Christiana, as a young woman who is beginning her career in sustainability and environmental communication, what advice do you have to get a spot, get to a spot where I can influence the most people to do their best? Start where you are. Start where you are and start to um, exercise the muscles of effective communication, of impactful messaging, and of using that to affect change. Um, a lot of that has to do with storytelling. We tend to get into our heads. And those of us who work on climate, we begin to you know, go into um, megatons and uh, carbon equivalent gases and I don't know what else. Um, and honestly, that means nothing. That means nothing to most people. What is really uh, effective is to tell stories of humans humanize the environment, humanize climate change, make it something that is important to me as the human being that you are talking to. And if you're able to do that, if you're able to take something as complex and as wicked, uh, in the best sense, as wicked as climate change and bring it down to what does it mean for my personal experience, then you've had an impact on me and on many other human beings. But as long as we stay out there in you know, cloud 49, you're not gonna make an impact. So definitely try to humanize, try to 
figure out what does it mean for the individual. A lot of that comes through listening, but a lot of it also comes through storytelling and storytelling that hits the heart in addition to the mind. Great. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about a donut economy and people asking, how do we encourage the world's elite to let go of their business model and economies and become more of a donut economy model with a Green New Deal? Well, yes, definitely. That's what I was speaking about um, before, but thank you for, for bringing uh, her work uh, here to, uh, to the discussion. Um, you know, I kind of suspect that um, this moving, this total tectonic movement that we have felt under our feet with COVID is going to help us to move toward much more of a donut economy that puts human well-being and planetary well-being at the center as opposed to the extract, use, and discard model that linear model uh, that, uh, that has been so prevalent over the past few years. I, I think um, you know, the, the experience that we're all having of truly beginning to understand who we are as humans and what our role is in this planet. How do we turn up in the world? How do we relate to each other? How do we relate to the resources on this planet? How do we relate to the biodiversity on this planet? I am constantly amazed at how many people, and I'm sure most, if not all of you on this call, have actually been asking yourselves that question over the past two months. And the answer to that question is the one that we will want to live by once we come out of the health crisis. If we come out of the health crisis and we forget that we have actually been asking ourselves all of these questions and we just go back to where we were in December of 2019 with all of our actions and with all of our policies and regulations, we will have totally wasted this incredible crisis, totally wasted. And we will have locked ourselves into a situation that is going to be irretrievable. So it is not, it, it is certainly about using this time to ask all ourselves all of these questions. Who are we? How do we turn up to each other and to the planet? But as we begin to answer those questions, to take the answers of those questions into our daily life once we get out of the health crisis. It is that remembering that is the trick. There's a huge amount of literature out there that during natural disasters, we humans turn into very wise people, very wise animals. And we have all of this you know, knowledge and insight. And then as soon as we go back to quote unquote normal, we have some kind of a lobotomy and we forget all of that. There's a huge amount of literature on that. This time, no lobotomy. We have to be able to remember what we have understood and put it into action. Christiana, I think we have only time for one more question. Grace, have you got one more question there? Okay. I've oh, got a thousand questions, but I'm so sorry, everybody. We, we will gather them all up, but one more question. Yeah, okay, so this one's from Lisa. Uh, through your role with the UN, have there been any conversations with global leaders or others that particularly stuck with you and why? Ah, I love that question. So I could give many examples, but I'm going to give you one. In 2000 and maybe it was 13 or 14, but one, one of those two, uh, I was at Davos at the World Economic Forum. Uh, and I was there in my role to, uh, you know, beat the drum uh, for corporate leaders and national leaders to take the development of the Paris Agreement seriously and move forward with the mission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I got a message from the CEO of one of the largest oil and gas companies uh, asking me to come to his Davos office. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Usually I ask these people, why is he asking me to come to his office? But, you know, he's a CEO of a very important oil and gas company. I will definitely go and see what he has to say. So I go to the meeting, um, and as I walk into his Davos office, he asks all of his staff to leave, uh, in which case I understood the message, and I asked my staff to please leave. 
So the two of us hunker down and he starts, you know, going on and on and on about, you know, the sector and, you know, all this information, all of the data, which I knew. I thought, this is, there's no point to this meeting. I wonder what's going on here. And then when I decided, well, you know, this, it's, it's enough. And I made a motion that I was ready to leave. He goes, no, Christiana, don't leave before I tell you what I really want to tell you. And I go, now it's getting interesting. And he said to me, Christiana, I want you to know that my 13-year-old daughter comes home every night and asks me, dad, what are you doing about my future? And that is the reason that I'm going to change this company. And I get all tear eyed when I remember this because there is one of the most powerful white gray haired men in the world leading one of the greatest oil and gas companies of the world. And who is it that turns his opinion around? His 13 year old daughter. Now, if that is not a beautiful example of what power really is, it's not about forcing people. It's about speaking directly to their heart. I do not know what better way to um end this uh this extraordinary hour with you christiana thank you so very much we have run out of time i wish we could talk to you for a, another hour but we will try to bottle up a lot of these questions and uh, see if we can get them answered um you know we individual action and system change is all interlinked and we have to do it all. We need to put pressure on politicians and hold them accountable for climate inaction. And we have to use our voices, everybody, and our votes. And we need to live climate action through absolutely every single thing we do. Please read Christiana's book. And please, if you haven't yet listened to um, the incredible podcast that she is part of, Outrage and Optimism, it is sensational and it is all about the outrage but it's the optimism that will keep you going every day you know one million women um, so one million women community let's do it let's make our movement bigger and stronger we have a big campaign coming up that will support literally support Christiana's 10-year plan to harbour missions um, and um, so please watch out for that. Make sure you're following us on all our channels, our Facebook, um, which is now almost at a million, um, a million community. Please follow us on our Instagram, um, read our blog. Just this year, our blog has been read 1.3 million times. Um, one, one Million Women is an environmental charity and we are just a really tiny team. So um, if you feel that you can support us, that would be incredible. Uh, we have a, a, cam a donation campaign going at the moment to help us through these really tough times of COVID. It's a $2 uh, donation campaign. If you feel that you can um, uh, can do that. It, we, it would be it would be really wonderful. The girls will put um, the link in in the chat, but it's also on the homepage of our website. Our two dollar COVID help us through COVID campaign. That would be amazing. Um, before we end off, I would just like us all to go on gallery view. Um, I, I do have one, there is, we're just gonna end off with our anthem. So I'll just say this quickly before we go on gallery, gallery view. Um, we're gonna end off with the One Me Women Anthem. And uh, we're ending off with this because uh, we did this ahead of the Paris um, COP. And, and I showed it to Christiana and a whole group of amazing women um, before, before we launched it. And I thought it'd be a beautiful thing to share that anthem with everybody now. It's had over 3.5 million views. It tells the story of climate action, giving climate hope. So please get your toes tapping. You will all know the song, or most of you will. Um, sing along with us. Never forget to use your voice. Um, stay to the end of the song if you've got time, but let's all go on gallery view. Let's all say a big clap and thank you to Christiana Figueres, to an amazing woman. Thank you so much for all you do for us at One Mean Women, Christiana. Um, let's all go on gallery view and, and then we're going to 
Everybody, a big clap for Christiana. Woo! <laughs> That's Shay, my daughter. She's in Spain. Hello, Shay. Hello, my darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you at the next event. Look out for it. Um, thank you for all the support you give to One Million Women. We cannot do it without you. Sit back, get those toes tapping, and sing along to You're the Voice. Bye, everyone. Bye. We had the chance to turn the pages over. We can write what we want to write. We gotta make ends meet before we get much older. We're all someone's daughter. We're all someone's son. Someone's son. Can we get each other? Try and understand it, make a noise and make it clear. We're not gonna sit in silence, we're not gonna live with fear. We know we all can stand together With the power to be powerful Believe that we can make it better yeah. We're all someone's daughter someone's daughter Silence.